Hello everyone, thank you for joining us at Change Now today and I'm very excited about our session because we will be talking about responsible beauty. My name is Marcel Vargas and I've been working on sustainability and cosmetics for over seven years now, uh, trying to support some of the largest corporations out there making those changes that they need to make to ensure that their business is future-proof. Uh, and while we've worked a lot with some of those big names, I am very excited because today we'll be joined by some of the pioneers out there. Maybe these are smaller brands, uh, you might not know them very well, but they are really changing the game and asking the right questions. Uh, so hopefully they will tell us a little bit more about what we're doing. And right now we'll start with Justine Uto, who I'd like to welcome. Hi, Justine. How are Hi, you? Hi, Marcel. Good, thank you. And you? Good. Uh, <laughs> welcome to Change Now. How are you feeling? Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. It's a huge event. It's something that is incredible. All around the world, we're talking about Change Now, about new innovation, about ecological innovation. And I'm really happy to be here to, to speak about Respire. <laughs> well, I'm glad to hear that. And I have to say, Respire is really an inspiring brand. Uh, your products are so simple, uh, your story as well is so, uh, so incredible. And I think that I'd like to start there. Uh, please tell me, why would a 20-something year old uh, tell herself, I'm going to start a deodorant, uh, especially when you see there's so much competition out there? That's a good question. <laughs> Actually, now I'm 27 years old and I was 24 years old when I I realized how our body is magic. I explain. Like, I am passionate about running, about sport, about, about marathons. I, I run a lot of marathons and ultra trail. And that's what made me realize how the body is magic and it's strong. But at that time, I also realized how our body is fragile and, and how we have to take care of it. Because we have only one body for the rest of our life. And I, I had the doctor uh, diagnosed me a tumor, a benign tumor, and that was, that's what made me realize this. And I wanted to find to 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 better understand the product that I used, um, the hygiene product, but also the food. And I, I looked at the deodorants that I was using every day. Each morning, I used deodorants like every people here, and I realized that I didn't understand what ingredients were in the deodorants, and that's what made me realized that I wanted to launch my brand, a brand that people can trust with natural products um, that are clean, and also a brand that can inspire people to take care of their body. Well, again, that's very inspiring. And just from hearing you talk, I can tell that this is not just about, about making a brand or making deodorants. This is really truly about something you're passionate and that you want your values to come through that brand Again, for me, one word that describes it is simple, because your products are very simple, and I mean that in the most, um, most wonderful way uh, possible. So I wanted also to ask you, what are those values that you want your brand to transpire and to inspire others as well? Hmm. First of all, I would say um, transparency. Transparency with our community, and that's why the community is the key success of Respire from the beginning. I started uh, talking to my community on Instagram to, to tell my story, to explain why I wanted to launch a deodorant. And the community, um, he is, he's really powerful because they help us to develop the first product, the deodorant. Now we co-create all the products with them. So there is a big transparency with them. They can understand all the, the product, the, choice, the choices that we, that we make. And, and the community also helped us when we launched Respire with a crowdfunding. Uh, there was a campaign and we, we sold uh, 21,000 deodorants in just a month. And that was the beginning of Respire. So the community understood that we, we are going to give more transparency. And yeah, that's a, a huge value for us. Then I would say uh, the quality of the products. The products for us, um, we develop products that are clean, with only clean formulas, only um, natural, the natural ingredients. Uh, it's more than 95% uh, natural ingredients. And we have also products, even if the products are bio or natural, we want also 
that they are efficient. Efficient and a good quality and pleasant to use. And this is not so easy to develop product like this. So it's a big move and we, we see that um, our community love our products because we have a good score, like 4.5 um, out of 5 on the score, so we're really happy. And also ecological products, this is a value that we have. Uh, we try to, to do the, um, the best choice uh, for our community. So we have products that are solid, solid products without packaging. Uh, so this is the best, I think, for the ecological move that we can do in our bathroom. And we have also uh, liquid products, but liquid products are recyclable, recycled, and refillable, rechargeable. So um, yes, we're working on this. <laughs> well, I would have to say that those are very bold and strong commitments. And I, I am very happy to see that because again, I'm working in the field for a long time and that's not something everyone's doing. Uh, and what leads me to another question, which is the fact that how a brand that like yours, which has been gaining so much momentum, you started with deodorant, but as you said, you have now what, maybe more than 20 products or so? Yes, sure, we have sun care, uh, toothpaste, we have body care, we have skin care. <laughs> so yeah, a lot of different things. And how do you manage to make sure that those values and those commitments that are so bold are, stay true? But, because what we see out there is that a lot of brands that start with very good intentions, mm -hmm. uh, when they develop, they figure out that maybe the market is not so simple and they have to abandon those. So what not only what are you doing to keep that, but what keeps you motivated uh, to ensure that? I would say that we listen to our community every day. We, we speak with the community and we ask them what they want as the product, the future product of Respire, what, what do we have to develop, and then we develop the products with them. And sometimes we have to do some education, some concession about some choices for the, for the um, ec ecological move. Um, I would explain myself like with the, the shower gel. We, we launched a shower gel. Why did we launch a shower gel? Because we saw that um, not all the people are ready to use a soap, like solid product. Uh, if we, we look at the market, in the shampoo market, uh, the solid shampoo is only 2% of the market. 2% of the market, so we, we see that not every people are ready to, to do the move. So we launched a shower gel and we wanted to launch a refillable product, so it's the bottle. And we, we, we decided to launch a bottle uh, instead of a doy pack. I don't know if you see a doy pack, it's like a, yeah, a doy pack maybe you see, where you have a bottle. Ouch. Yeah, and uh, the doy pack is not so uh, ecological because it's, it is not recyclable, because it's not monomaterials. So we have to do an education with our community to explain them that if we do that choice, it's because the other one, it's not the best alternative. So we, we work a lot with CTO. CTO that is a big organis organism in France to, 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 to do the, the select of the... I don't know how to say that, to recyclable things. Um, and uh, they help us to find the best alternatives to, yes, to respond to, to the demand of our community. And yeah, so this is the big thing that we do to stick to our DNA um, to answer uh, the needs of the clients. And yeah, I think it's this. <laughs> <laughs> well, I. I think it's easier said than done, so <laughs> kudos to you for managing that. Uh, I do have two follow-ups to that question, and the first one would be that, um, again, what would your recommendations be for other companies, uh, larger or smaller, that are just starting uh, to follow your tracks and what you're trying to achieve? Are, are there any tips and tricks you could share with them? Mm. Uh, the first thing I would say is to listen to the market. Listen to the market, listen to the clients, listen to the, what they want as the product. Um, f for your business, if you, if you launch a product that clients don't want, it's not good for your business, but it's not good for the environment because nobody will, will, will buy the product. So um, listen to the market and then uh, stick to your DNA, to your values. It's really important to, yeah, to stick to that. And, yeah, that would be this. And then to, 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 yeah, to meet people that inspire them. Like all the time since the beginning of Respire, I contact people that inspired me. Uh, I want to ask them how to do this because 
I'm 27 years old. Actually, I don't know how to manage a business every day to, to, to develop a product, to, yeah, to follow the growth. So, um, yeah, I, I meet people and it's, uh, it's the thing that helped me um, yeah, to, to, to follow the growth of Respire every day, <laughs> I think. <laughs> and would you say that there are any like small tweaks or small fixes, just basic things mm -hmm. that you would like other companies to do that you don't understand why they're not doing it uh, while it's maybe simpler than it looks? I'm asking the question just because yeah. to maybe help you develop because I see that um, your packaging is yeah. rec from recycled material and yeah. recyclable. Yeah. And yet there are so many solutions out there that would, that's just not the case. Uh, so I'm thinking that you probably have some business input to provide as well uh, in how to achieve those goals. Achieve that goals? Um, I don't know how to answer this, actually. <laughs> uh, what do I say? So the, the thing that the other companies don't do or do? Yeah, they don't do, but they could. Hmm. Um, actually, there are a lot, but we see since we launched Respire, uh, we see that other big groups are moving. Mm. They're, actually, they're moving since a lot of time, but they, they don't have the agility and the flexibility of a small brand like us. So uh, when we launched the Solid Shampoo, we were actually one of the first on the market, one of the first. No, but there were like 20 solid shampoo on the French market. And after that, we saw in the last year, a lot of solid shampoo coming. So that for me, it's really good because um, we're all talking about new innovation, about new products that are better for environment. So um, yes, yeah, sometimes we launch product and we say, why they didn't do that before us? <laughs> so yes, we asked some questions, but I'm sure the industry is going in the same way and that's really good. I'm really happy for that. Well, that's wonderful. The other follow-up that I had, which is more um, about your community. Yeah. You mentioned frequently that your community is so important that uh, it's a very close-knit group somehow, uh, that you uh, keep it active yourself. Uh, you are very much involved in the communications or marketing. And from just, again, hearing you talk, I can tell that for you it's very important to make that transition. So. Um, how do you ensure that uh, your consumers are open to things that maybe they were not so open to before? Like you said, not so many people are ready to use solid shampoo, yeah. but you're probably trying to convince them that that's the yeah. case sure. uh, or that they could. So how are you managing that? Definitely. Um, mm, it's a really good question. That's true. We are on the social media every day. We speak with our community every day. And I think now, they can trust Respire, they can trust us, they can trust me actually, because uh, I'm the, the, the figure of the brand. And a lot of people are, I, I'm really proud to say that, that a lot of clients of Respire are ready to, to try our products because they trust us. And then if they don't want to, to try it, we, we do things now on our website because we have a hybrid distribution. We have our website and we have also distribution in a retail store like Monoprix, Sephora, and also pharmacy. And when they, they order on our website and they order, for example, um, a shower gel, we are putting in the, in the package also a soap so they can try the soap. And maybe the next time they will order the soap because they tried it and they like it. So um, yes, I try to convince them. Also, we have a lot of word of mouth and that is the, the strong power of the brand. During the first year of Respire, we didn't spend uh, one euro in marketing. That was only organic videos on social media uh, and word of mouth between the community. I, I saw a lot of uh, Instagram posts on Instagram that was crazy about my deodorants, and that was my goal. Like, if I launch a deodorant and a brand, I want picture of deodorants on Instagram. But it's a big deal, actually. Who posts a deodorant photo on Instagram? And I saw a lot, and that that is because people that didn't want to show I use these deodorants, they wanted to show I understand the values and I share the values with that brand, and. Yeah, that is what we are proud today, and that's how we 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 succeed to to yeah to to sell our products to to new clients to acquire new clients and to 
yeah, to make them test our new product. And then because we, we work a lot on the efficiency, the quality of the product and the, 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 yeah, the repeat purchase, we see that people like our product. And if they don't like it, if a product uh, has not a good score, we will work it. It's all the time we, we work the old products, old products actually, they are just two years old, but the, the product that we, we launched, um, if people are not happy with that product, we will launch it. And today, to be sure that we launch a product that the community loves, we, we launched it recently, like months ago, um, we launched the Ruche, La Ruche Respire. <laughs> it's, a, it's a group uh, with 200 people from our community that will test the product and try it before we launch it. So they co-create the product with us during all the co-creation development and then they try it. It's uh, more than 100 people that try the product and they give us the score. They, they, they give us some, yeah, some returns about the product and then we can rework it and launch only the product that they love. And yeah, I'm really happy that we do that because now we can say that we launch products that people love. <laughs> well, that's amazing to hear. Thank you very much, Justine, for joining you, us Marshall. today. It was wonderful. I know you have other things to attend, so I'm not keeping you any longer. And again, I think that it really shows the importance of a strong community uh, when we're talking about sustainability. Thank you again. Thank you. Uh, so we're going to be joined by someone else now. So we are going to uh, receive and welcome uh, Anne Bonner from uh, Estamp, but we'll also have online Arnaud Lonslo from Cozy. So uh, thank you again, Justine, and talk to you soon. <laughs>
two very pioneering brands, and it's wonderful to see that change going on. Uh, I do have one question, and it's maybe a tricky one, but I, I do think it's worth asking, because it's a question I myself ask. As you know, I've been working with cosmetic brands for a long time now, and people outside of the cosmetics industry, sometimes they come up to me and tell me, um, why are you working on cosmetics? Like, that's not making any difference out there. When you look at the impacts in the world, uh, when you know that the food industry or the textile industry or air travel are so big contributors to the problems that we have in society, why should we care about more sustainable cosmetics? And so, well, I know that I have my own answer, but I want to hear your thoughts about why you think that cosmetics need to make that change. I, first of all, I think there are two main changes that we, to, we have to try to overcome in the beauty industry at the moment. The first one is about the supply chain, because it's really hard you know, to have really good transparency on the supply chain on ingredients at the moment. And also our big change in the industry at the moment is the packaging. Um, I was reading um, a recent um, study what was, that was saying that very soon, nine out of 10 people you know, uh, won't buy uh, a brand if they realize that the packaging is not sustainable, a beauty brand, I mean. So it's really huge. So I think that's why we have to do it, to do it because people won't buy, uh, you know, in the coming years, um, products that are not sustainable in terms of ingredients, but also products that are not sustainable in terms of packaging. So I think that's why we have to move because it's really people expectation and they are shifting lifestyle. And so. do you agree or any other things that you think are relevant as well? Yeah, I see two elements that are very close to, to what uh, Anne just said. First, uh, as, a, as a citizen, as a, as a consumer, you cannot by yourself decide to set up, uh, I don't know, uh, wind turbines or solar panels uh, everywhere. So, but as a consumer, you have some power to do the good decisions and to improve many things. So if you start from this, why should we stop in the kitchen? We should also go to the, uh, to the bathroom where there is a lot to be done. So first, the fact that the consumer can be active and in, in the change, very important. Second, I would say that this cosmetic industry is an industry of well-being, of dream. And if we want to keep that way, it must be very consistent. We cannot have a lot of pollution and a lot of waste and pretending to be a dream industry. It's impossible. So we have to be pioneers in this industry so as to onboard also other industries. That's why cosmetics is a very good uh, it's a very important uh, industry to, to, to improve things and to change. I completely agree with you both. And I would add one thing that I think it's also uh, close to my heart, which is that I think that the cosmetics industry is interesting because it's a little bit uh, the cross point or the playground for a lot of innovation because it's the place where uh, agriculture through the natural ingredients, chemistry, materials, they all meet and play together. So it's also something that I find very interesting. And so a little based on that uh, notion, I was wondering if there are, what are the key changes that you think the industry needs to make? What are the main elements that uh, really need to be transformed in the industry if we want to be able to say that the cosmetics industry in general is sustainable? Maybe you can start, Anne. Yeah, no problem. So as I said before, I think the one of the major changes we have to make, uh, and it's also one of the most difficult when you're a brand, it's the packaging. I think we have to reduce, first of all, when we can, um, the use of plastic, because we know there is really a limited part of plastic which is actually recycled. So we really have to try to reduce and create packaging um, and to take care about the materials and the components of this packaging when we start designing it. Um, and so we have also to prioritize, and I think Arno will be agree with me, but we have to start prioritize reuse and refill uh, because that's the future and that's all we will help people to shift, you know, the way they use cosmetics, but also to shift the way, you know, we generate uh, waste in the cosmetic industry. So I think that's the main change at the moment to start. Well, uh, great to know that. And 
are there any other things as well that you see on your end, uh, Arno, that need to improve uh, in the oil industry? No, I totally agree. There is there is already a, a strong shift towards clean beauty for mm. you know from indie brands, from large brands. Everyone is going uh, at least natural, a bit of organic, and so on. So it's important on the ingredients, but. I totally agree, of course, with Emma. Recycling is not sufficient. Uh, maybe you can do the loop once or twice, but then it goes to the uh, to the trash, so it's not sufficient. We must uh, reuse, uh, refill, and and go beyond the simple uh, recycling. So packaging is a is a very important thing. And by the way, we have, um, uh, as I said, we we work uh, with uh, jars and and, uh, and bottles that are in glass, which makes it possible to be reusable. And we have done the lifetime cycle analysis. And the conclusion is that when you reuse your bottle instead of throwing it away, you decrease your CO2 consumption by 79%. So there is a big impact due to this packaging. Yeah. Well, that's great to hear. And I'm very happy to know that you're using life cycle assessment as well. That's one of my fields of expertise. So <laughs> that's great to hear. Um, and just hearing you talk, I can't help but wonder. Uh, it seems to me, as you said, that the changes that we need to make or the solutions that uh, are necessary are both known and available. Uh, so, for example, I know that, Cozy, you have worked a lot on having your own refillable fountains. Uh, we know that uh, reusable, recyclable packaging is available. Uh, we know what clean ingredients means. We know how to make natural and organic. So. Uh, again, going a little bit back to the question I asked Justine earlier, what are the, the challenges that you see yourself of things that, uh, the main obstacles that are um, slowing down the industry, that are making it so that the industry is not moving as fast as we would like, uh, and that change is not happening? Uh, Arno, do you want to start? Yeah, maybe yes, that's why we don't know this time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, indeed there is um, a big change a big shift in the business model that needs to be implemented if you want to go to reuse instead of single-use plastics, if, if, you go, if you want to go to organic and stuff like that. So I, I don't see any obstacle because consumers already and companies are following. The only obstacle that I can see is time because as I say, there is a shift in the business model and the more we, we, we find solutions in those areas, the faster we go down the learning curve and we benefit from scale effect. So we, as a small company, we started from scratch with uh, something clever in terms of sustainability. So we are already, uh, uh, how to say, uh, profitable. So we have reached profitable levels. For large corporations, it's a big shift. And you need to go down the scale effects so as to, to have, a, again, a profitable business model for them. So for me, it's just a matter of time. Okay. Uh, and what about you, Anne? Do you I, find other challenges? I'm, I'm going to speak maybe for um, young, younger brands. Uh, but I think one of the main challenges when you want to be sustainable and to do it right, you know, also when you have your first product on the market is also the investment, the financial aspect. Because for example, at Estamp, we design our own packaging in cork, made from cork, because it's a biodegradable um, uh, component and it's also naturally renewable and et cetera, et cetera. So we really had to create from scratch something that didn't exist yet. And it means more cost, more development, more research. And when you're a very young brand that, you know, start in the industry, it's, it's quite a challenge, actually, because obviously you have, you know, to have all the, the, the finance and uh, investment, you know, among your company. So I think that's also why people uh, or young brand, let's say, make gradual progress and, you know, don't make a whole revolution all at once because they can't afford it at the beginning. So you just optimize one part of your business, one side of the product, and you do it your best one step, you know, afterwards. So. And I'd like to go back to that uh, because, again, we are trying to inspire as many people as we can out there and making sure that they start doing those changes. And I think that the discussion right now is especially valuable for entrepreneurs who are going that way. Uh, so 
Could you provide us one example in your company, uh, I don't know if it's the cork uh, packaging or other, of how you managed to achieve that? Where were the steps? How was the process? How did you ensure that it all worked out? Uh, so to try to make a sustainable packaging in the makeup industry, we try to think the product um, in the entire uh, life, you know, time of the product. And so when you do this, do that, the first step is, okay, what I'm going to use as, you know, component of my packaging. Because from the beginning, if I started with the wrong material, even if I do something refillable, if one day people want to anyway throw it away, you know, where it goes, what, you know, what it becomes. So you have to wonder all those questions. So that's why you would choose cork, because uh, it was something we could find close to France, in Spain. Uh, it was literally the bark of uh, oak trees. So it was natural, 100%. You just, you know, collect the bark and it's renewable naturally every nine, 10 years. And from this uh, cork, we just, you know, uh, make our packaging. And, and if one day people don't want to refill their packaging for X and Y reasons, uh, if, you know, it goes to the trash, it's just literally just, you know, bark. So from trees, so it's natural and it will go back to nature actually. So I will say that we, we try to picture the product in its, in its uh, entire you know, lifetime. So well, that's uh, how we try to approach. Well, I really like that example uh, because it really shows what uh, was also being mentioned by Arnaud, so life cycle thinking. How do we make sure that we take into account the whole life cycle and not focus only on one aspect? Uh, and actually that leads me down to one last question maybe, we'll see, um, which is the fact that my impression is that a lot of brands use sustainability as a marketing argument or as a competitive advantage. So pretty much they are telling consumers, buy our product because it is greener. Uh, and what I wonder sometimes it's whether that is limiting the change because maybe uh, companies do not want to share their secrets because it's a competitive advantage. Maybe they don't want to share their technologies because they fear that others would make the same claims they are making right now. So I wanted to ask you um, whether you think that is the case and whether you think that the industry should be working more uh, as a group uh, to see those changes happen. Uh, it's a bit of a yes or no question, <laughs> because um, yes, at the moment, I think it's a comp competitive advantage because not every brand is doing it, let's face it. But I really believe that in the coming decade, it will be something we just owe to the customer, just because the emergency of the situation will just, you know, urge and push all the companies to do it. But in another end, I also believe that we could solve some um, shared challenges collectively. Uh, for example, you know, collecting uh, the packaging waste in the industry, because when you're a small brand or one brand doing it, it's very, it costs a lot, but also one brand doing it, it doesn't, you know, have so much an impact. So maybe we, we will, be able to work, you know, uh, as a collective to make this better. But um, yeah, so I think some solution can be solved collectively and without, you know, um, giving any competitive advantage to your competitors or whatsoever. So. Well, that sounds good. And um, I'm wondering, Arno, do you share that vision of the industry? And also maybe can you share uh, what you're doing in that front? Because I know that that's something you're very passionate about as well. Yeah, exactly. I love, uh, I love this question because I'm very optimistic on this aspect. I definitely consider as, uh, yeah, that it's very important. It's a competitive advantage today to be sustainable. It won't last, but today this is the case. And it's good because competitors or followers will level up their sustainability engagements and pioneers will move on inventing. So we consider ourselves as pioneers. So we constantly innovate in, uh, in refill solution, deposit uh, loops, and so on. But also, as you mentioned, we, our approach is to promote a sustainable consumption in the industry. So we also want to onboard uh, other brands. 
small, large, whatever, if they want to go for refill solution and circular economy, we must help them. We've gone down the, the learning curves, the experience curves, the scale effects, we must help them. So beyond our uh, cozy brand, we have developed a part of our business when, where we help uh, brands to put refill equipment on the market so that the consumer in store, in store can refill himself. So we have helped uh, Yves Rocher, Pierre Fabre, Mustela and uh, Beauty Kitchen, so big brands, with, by providing them with uh, equipment, refill solutions, machines, that makes it possible for the consumer to refill. So we love to onboard all the players. We stay one step ahead because we constantly innovate, but it's important to spread, uh, to spread the, good, uh, the good deeds. Well, I'm very happy to hear that. I do think that that's something more and more brands should be doing and trying to share uh, their technologies. That is something I'm very passionate about as well. And as part of my job in our company called Qantas, we try to launch uh, multi-partner initiatives with the industry as well so that we can push all together in the same direction. So thank you for sharing that example, which is fantastic. So I want to thank you both again. Uh, it's been very interesting to have this chat with you. Uh, I'm also very happy to see that we are aligned on those changes, how we see and how we know what, what we need to change in packaging, in formula. So thank you for joining us uh, this morning uh, and hopefully we can have another chat soon. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. Uh, We are welcoming our last guest today, uh, a little bit of a different profile since it's not so much of a uh, entrepreneur, but maybe someone who was more of a pioneer to begin with uh, and with their brand. So we are welcoming Claire Vianot. Thank you for joining us uh, today uh, at the Change Now uh, set. And so you have more than 14 years of experience in the cosmetics industry. Uh, you have work been working with uh, L'Occitan Group for a while now. Right now, you're uh, the managing director for France and Benelux region for the Melvita brand, uh, which is pretty well known now as one of the leaders, uh, especially regarding the organic products. So maybe you can start by telling us more about why the brand decided to go that way, mm -hmm. the history of the brand. I, I find it very inspiring to see why, was, why that was started. <laughs> Thank you. So, yeah, um, if I can start with a bit of, uh, of the history, uh, the brand was uh, founded in 1983 in uh, the Ardèche region of uh, France. So it's a region in south of France. And since our birth, actually, we are a purpose native company uh, because Ardèche, it's a very uh, wild region in France, preserved from pollution. And so the brand has always been embedded in nature and has always, always known uh, the, the power of nature, but also its fragility. And that is why, since the beginning, we are committed to, to protect it. So yes, that's about our story. A, a French company born in, a, in, a, in Ardèche and really a purpose native from the beginning. Um, if I, if I now have to say a bit more about what we do at Melvita, so as you said, we are a pioneer in uh, the organic uh, revolution, in the organic cosmetics. And today we are still a reference uh, in that field in France. And uh, we have a, a team of passionate people which really uh, are doing their best every day to uh, deliver uh, products uh, to the consumer which are um, committed Committed care, we call that committed care because it's uh, products, beauty products, which um, avoid to make compromise. They are going to give the consumer uh, efficacy, pleasure in use, in beauty, and also no compromise for the health or the environment. So yes, that's what we do at Melvita. We do uh, committed skin care in, uh, in order for our consumers to, to have, uh, have it all. I have a short follow-up to that introduction. Mm -hmm. um, I can't help but wonder, and, and I know we chatted a little bit of this, about this before, and I wanted you to share it with everyone else, um, of why uh, you decided to go the organic route when no one else was doing it. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's, it's kind of a, 
the, the, tr the true story of our founder, because our founder was a biologist which uh, lived in the city, and he decided to leave the city to go in Ardèche. And uh, once he has discovered this region and the harmony between nature and man, he really wanted to uh, develop products which are uh, uh, more respectful. And uh, with his science, actually, he developed a cosmetic brand. Well, that's very interesting because it's true that um, it's important th to see that science was a big factor in his decision to go the organic route. Yeah. So he knew the value of going organic when we were talking about cosmetics. So based a little bit on that, because again, you are already well positioned as the organic leader probably uh, in terms of cosmetics. What is the future for Melvida right now? How are you uh, still innovating and making those changes to what organic means? Yes. Um, I think at Melvita that we are all convinced that uh, now we need to go beyond organic certification. And uh, we intend to uh, open a new path, actually, which, is, which we call sustain organic. So uh, since we have a, a French audience, I believe, sometimes I would say it in French also, it's what we call bio durable. Um, and this approach of uh, sustain organic is, uh, is really key because it really uh, adds to the organic certification of the markers of sustainability. So it uh, could be for Melvita local production or local sourcing, a fair approach with our producers, um, transparency, complete transparency on our product composition, uh, also, um, um, our uh, uh, non-profit commitment. So it's, it's different aspects to add to the organic certification. And uh, what is really important for us is that in all what we do, actually, we really look at all the value chain uh, from uh, the beginning, from the sourcing, to actually the, the final product in order to uh, have a positive impact. So that's what we call actually sustain organic. It's really going from A to Z to uh, improve the impact of our products. Okay, so I think I get the gist of it. Uh, it really sounds like something very, very interesting. Uh, but maybe just so that everyone uh, understands what it truly means, mm -hmm. I think it'd be relevant to share. I'm sure you have one example that you can share yes. of one product, how you're doing that through the entire value chain. Yeah, yeah, but you know, I'm always uh, very proud of my products. So I brought one uh, here. I don't know if uh, it's uh, seen well. So it's our uh, uh, Nectar de Rose day cream. So it's our number one uh, face care item. And uh, what is imp so here I'm going to explain with this product actually from A to Z, what does it mean? So I think we, we see here a picture of the first step actually, which is the sourcing of the ingredient, the picking. In this product, there is a key ingredient, which is the wild rose. And we have a traceable sourcing in France from the Vercors, uh, at Luce La Croix Haute, exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we have signed with the supplier uh, what we call a sustainable picking charter in order to uh, protect biodiversity and wild flora. So, uh, for example, when they pick on the, on the shrub, they do not take all the plant. They always leave like 10% of the plant in order to protect the flora. So it, it's really important for us to manage this first step of sourcing as much as possible. Second step, uh, when you have the, the ingredient, you put it in a formula, actually. And uh, for us, uh, organic formula. Uh, so for everyone to know, when you, uh, you look for an organic product, you have to look for a label. Uh, like, as you can see here, the label Cosme Bio that uh, we are signing off. And this label is giving you first a very clear and public charter that everyone can see okay. on what is in the product and what is not in the product. And also what this label gives you is that it is certified by an external uh, party, which is EcoCert, which ensures the consumers actually that we respect all these criteria. So more concretely, what it gives in this product, it's 99% uh, of a natural ingredient. Uh, the insurance that there is no ingredients that are cultivated with pesticide in it, no ingredient that could be harmful for the health or the environment, and uh, no artificial colorant, uh, no synthetic fragrance. So all that insurance are really public, communicated in that charter uh, widely and transparently. Um, the third step, bear with me, so there are just two left, 
it's uh, the production and I'm uh, very proud to share with you the picture of our uh, eco factory which is located uh, in Ardèche in Lagorce. Uh, I can tell everyone that actually you can visit it. So uh, there is uh, one uh, team member of Melvita, Pauline, which will be very uh, happy to, to do a guided tour for you. And this uh, eco uh, she's it's, uh, it's really doing its best to minimize the impact on uh, the environment. Uh, so we have uh, a grass roofing, as you can see here, to, to really be uh, embedded environment. Uh, we have light veils, photovoltaic panel in order to limit our consumption of electricity. And we have a, a huge collector of uh, rainwater in order also to limit our consumption of water. So, at the production step, again, we do everything to limit our impact. And also it's produced in France. So for us, it's, uh, it's very good because then for delivery, it's also favor uh, short circuits. Uh, last step, the packaging, uh, because uh, it was a, a good topic that you had before with uh, Cozy and also with Estampe. And I think it's uh, all a question that we have to uh, work on when uh, we, uh, we talk about cosmetics. So at Melvita, at every product we, we launch, we try to improve at food, our footprint when it comes to packaging. Um, so first, when you talk about packaging, we have two things, huh, the outer box and the tube. So on Melvita, we try to limit the number of outer box. We have only 16% of our products with outer box. Um, then all the cardboard that, that we use, yeah, they, it's coming from FSC certified forest, so manage sustainably forest. And also, we don't put any label, additive label in our products. Uh, you have the usage advice, which are printed inside. All the efficacy proof points which are needed for purchase are on the packaging, so we, are, we do not add more leaflets. And last but not least on the outer box, when we relaunched this uh, box came from 330 grams to uh, 300 grams. And since we have uh, a lot of volumes on Melvita, in, in two years actually it's already two tons of uh, cardboard save. So as many uh, tree as left cut. So it's, uh, it's with this kind of uh, rework that we try to improve our footprint. And when we look at the tube, uh, aside the point of uh, recycle, uh, to being recycled, uh, we also try to maximize the part of recycled material in the packaging, actually, in order to close that loop, as uh, the two person mentioned before. And in this tube, there is 50% of recycled plastic. Uh, and you can see here, as a consumer, actually, you, when you look closely, you see somewhere some dark dots, and that shows you, actually, that there is a recycled material in that. So yes, this is clearly what uh, we aim to do, what we call uh, sustain organic. It's really to try to uh, have a positive impact, a better impact on all the value chain of our product. Well, I find that incredible just because there is so much going on that people don't even yeah. realize. No, that. yeah, <laughs> not so much people know, unfortunately. <laughs> and I, and I have to say, because um, as, I've, as I said, I've worked with a lot of brands out there that it goes beyond what most think is achievable because when you tell some brands to have 50% of recycled content, they will tell you that's not possible and yet you're doing it. So I know that there are challenges in mm -hmm. what you're achieving. So I'll ask you a little bit of my fetish question that I asked beforehand. Mm -hmm. What are the difficulties you're encountering uh, when you want to manage all of that uh, in one product? Mm -hmm. um... I think it's a good question. Uh, to be fair for everyone, it's, it's, we all have difficulties in that path. We all have to, uh, to acknowledge that it will be a long and hard path to achieve. So I think it's, it's important to, to start it, to be uh, in a, a path of improvement as we are every day, and to do a test and learn every time we can. So um, I don't believe there will be a miracle solution. Uh, one, uh, one of the the, the main issue when we talk about cosmetics, as you rightly talked earlier, it's, uh, some, it's the packaging. So we try some alternatives actually with our consumers. So for example, in July, we are going to launch a solid shampoo uh, in order to test uh, uh, no water, no plastic alternative. We are also working on a bulk distribution. Um, so here, yes, it's still a, it's still a challenge for us uh, to, be, to be honest, because uh, when it comes to uh, organic formulation actually 
Uh, the organic formulas are, are more sensitive because uh, they are based on natural preservative. So for us, it, it's quite a challenge uh, to ensure that the formula will not be contaminated with the refill, especially when it comes to face care. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a product, project we are working on for a long time now, still not out there. I'm, uh, uh, so yes, it's, but as I said, I think the importance, it's really to start this, this path and uh, to be convinced that we are going into the right direction and continue to improve. I, I have a little bit of a follow-up. It's a little bit of a different question uh, in the same direction yet um, because most of the brands we talked to today are younger brands who are just starting on their journey. And Melvita, on the other hand, has been in the market for a while now, so you are well positioned and you have a long history. And I can't help but imagine that in that path, you've probably made some mistakes, things you decided upon and then you realized maybe it was not the best choice for the environment uh, mm -hmm. or for society. So can you tell us more about what those mistakes can be and especially how can we make sure we avoid them as much as possible? Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, uh, the question of mistake, it's, it's a good question, but tricky question. Um, so I, I think the, the, the first point uh, to, to mention for me is that the main mistake you can make is uh, number one to be to what we call greenwashing because you really need to be humble and sincere in the path you take throughout the ecological transition. And now consumers, they are more aware, more informed, so they won't forgive companies which are not putting acts uh, after their communication. So this is one of a, a challenge, a mistake that can be made, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think also uh, from our experience on Melvita, as you said, we are here for 38 years now. Uh, we sell uh, 2.5 million of units a year, so it's just in France. So it's, we need to have a process. And that's why I was explaining you before. I think the advice maybe I can, uh, I can um, give is to really think globally, actually, on the chain and act collectively. Uh, at Melvita, really, we, we, uh, we think we can't do this alone. So uh, that's why I'm personally part of a Cosme Bio association, which we group uh, 500 brands of organic cosmetics. And with Cosme Bio, we, we work actually on the bulk subject, and we have a partnership with Réseau Vrac to do that. Uh, I'm also part of a, a coalition which is called Social Commerce for Good. Uh, which, is, uh, which aims is to improve the impact of the e-commerce delivery. And I'm uh, really uh, convinced by this project because e-commerce is going so big at the moment that uh, we really need to address that. And th uh, in this uh, coalition, if I can describe, around the table there are brands, so not just Melvita, but other brands, there are uh, carriers, there are logisticians, and I think it's really important, as I said, to, to think global and to have a, a comprehensive vision of your footprint. Uh, because, for example, when you talk about e-commerce delivery, at the beginning we were okay, focusing on uh, let's, let's find the greenest cardboard for our packaging delivery. And then when you discuss with logisticians or carriers, one of the main issues actually is that they are carrying a lot of emptiness like 45 to 50 percent in standard box when we talk about e-commerce delivery. So then the discussion is not so much on what's the material right for the box, but more can we do uh, sizable packaging which are close to the products and things like that. So um, yes, it's, it's very helpful, I think, for everyone to look at the global chain in order to avoid uh, missing, let's say, uh, an impact that could be much bigger than the one that they would have uh, thought. Yeah, and I, I fully align with that because, again, we see those mistakes happen. Mm -hmm. uh, we see those trade-offs that can happen when we make one decision on one aspect without looking at the full picture. So I, I completely get uh, what you're coming from. And I have a little bit of a bonus question since we have a little bit of time oh. left. <laughs> uh, you're, you talk a lot about how important it is to have the whole value chain uh, yeah. in mind. And uh, I was wondering, uh, what trends do you see on the side of the consumer? What is changing from the consumer aspect uh, in, your, in your industry in general? Yeah, uh, but I think what we see, especially uh, post-COVID phase, is the consumer, they are even more uh, convinced and concerned by uh, the need of changing their habits. So again, as I said, 
there's not going to be one solution. So we see some people are trying solids, some people are tr changing their habits in order to try bulk distribution. Some, they still want to have uh, their beautiful package in their bathroom, but they are going for cleaner alternatives. So uh, clearly we see that Melvita is today answering uh, a need. It's a good momentum for us because uh, I think uh, consumers are more and more in need for brands which uh, act and which are uh, uh, yes, uh, consistent on all their uh, proposition. Um, yeah, so I think it's uh, the, the trend, clean beauty, as they said uh, earlier, has been there for a while. And I think now it's what we call uh, in the business blue beauty. It's like, it's not just green, it's also green plus other element of sustainability. And that's why at Melvita, we really want to open this new path of uh, sustain organic. Organic, uh, it's really what you can get best when we co you talk about clean beauty. But then you add other element of sustainability and it's uh, the greatness of sustain organic, I believe. Well, thank you very much, Claire. It has thank you, been very, very interesting discussing with you today. Uh, and hopefully we can have another chat another time. But again, thank you for joining us. It's really inspiring to see how a brand that has a long history like Melvita is still uh, leading the way and still making those changes that are necessary for society. Thank you. Thank you.